When it comes to drift retardants and just in general spray adjuvants anymore, it seems like every company's got a whole mix of products you could use. And boy, if every company's got a bunch of different things, you add those all up, I mean, it's literally thousands of products you have to choose from. Well, how are you gonna figure out what to do? We get more questions about these types of products than almost anything else, and half the time, it's names we've never even heard of. So we wanna talk today about separating those things. What do you need? What do you not need? Well, I think it's important to put them into categories. You can say, oh, is it a crop oil? Is it an anionic surfactant? Is it a drift retardant? What is it going to be? That way you can start to, even if you don't know what all the names are in that category, you can start putting things into a situation where you can evaluate them. All right, the first thing that I wanted to cover is drift retardants. There are a lot of people talking about reducing drift, reducing volatility, and those are good things to do. Well, what do you do with these drift retardants when there are so many of them out there? One of the things we like is the HPG polymer. Now, there are old polyacrylamide products. There are also some lecithin products that aren't too bad, but that HPG polymer, that's probably our favorite. There are a number of these different products out there. Our biggest suggestion to you, though, is start small. Start with a low rate and then maybe work your way up. Because if you use too much of almost any drift retardant, it can become a problem for you in your spray tank, in your pump, and that's the last thing you want to have happen because if that ends up getting out of your nozzle, well, hopefully it at least gets out of your nozzle, but if it does, you might be changing the pattern of your sprayer. And all of a sudden, you've got streaks going through your field, so just be really careful with these drift retardants. They're good products, but try to pick HVG polymers, and then try to use low rates, building up a little bit from there. Once you've proven, oh, a low rate isn't gonna cause me any problems and have realistic expectations. When you're using a drift return, that doesn't mean, hey, it's a 40 mile an hour wind, I can go out there and spray, because I have this product in here that's gonna keep it in my field. Darren, even a no. 15 or 20 mile an hour wind, because some of these labels will say 15 miles an hour, you're, you're, you're fine to spray. Uh, we don't really believe that in a lot of cases. You have to be careful and look at what the downwind target is. Also volatility. They're not going to stop volatility. So we're talking about physical drift here. So it's going to stop it from blowing a particle across. It's not going to stop something like an old 2,4-D formulation or an old dicamba formulation from picking up and moving after you spray. All right, the next thing is to take a look at the label of the herbicide that you're using. That's not too tough. But what happens when you look at the label of three different herbicides that you're all throwing in the same tank together? That's where in a lot of cases you need a good agronomist. So even in our own situation on our farm, we're taking a look at, hey, if the weather is cooler and drier, then maybe we need to switch over to something else. Well, maybe we need something to penetrate that leaf a little better, and then I'd say, all right, we gotta step up to something that's got an oil in it. I usually try to keep this simple when we talk about spray adjuvants, and I'm only dealing with three things uh, from the liquid side. I'm dealing with MSO, crop oil, or non-ionic surfactant. The non-ionic surfactant's great for spreading and sticking, with methylated seed oil, that's almost at the extreme other end. Not only is it spreading and sticking, it's really getting burned, it's really penetrating through the leaf. Crop oil is a little bit in between, but crop oil also will help penetrate much faster. So the big thing to understand, non-ionic surfactants, just spreading and sticking, crop oil, methylated seed oil are going to burn through a thick waxy cuticle and get you into some of the tougher weeds faster. Here's the other key there that Brian mentioned is just that you may need to switch adjuvants depending on the weather conditions. So when you're talking to your agronomist and he says, you know what, if it gets cold, we're going to switch to this. But if it's hot, we really like to use this one instead. I would suggest bringing both of them home. You can always return one of them later if you don't use it. And the adjuvants are really the smallest expense in the whole process here. Generally, whatever the main product you're spraying, in this case, likely a herbicide is going to be the one that costs the most money. So have some extra adjuvant on home at home and then understand, hey, if it's cool, I switch to this. If it's hot or if it's dry or whatever the weather condition is that you have to make a change, have both on hand so you can adjust on the fly. The last thing I wanted to bring up is nitrogen source. There are some products that need a nitrogen source. Let's take Roundup, for example. We've always said use ammonium sulfate with Roundup. That's the cheapest way to get a good nitrogen source, as well as do some other things in that spray tank and, and help the Roundup performance. Okay, that's great. With some weeds, like water hemp, for example, somewhat nitrogen sensitive. So if you have ammonium sulfate, which has some nitrogen in there, together with Roundup, now you have better performance on that water hemp. So if the water hemp is small 
and you have ammonium sulfate in, you have a lot better chance to kill the weed. All right, but there are also some products that we really don't want ammonium sulfate. Ammonium sulfate can lower the pH a little bit. So I think about the old Accent, for example, we didn't usually like ammonium sulfate. We got better performance with straight liquid 28%. Just make sure you're getting a good spray grade 28% that's not all contaminated with dirt and everything else. But I guess the big thing here is when we start talking about extend beans, we really don't want ammonium sulfate in there at all. Because what we found, what researchers have found, I should say, is dicamba has more volatilization when it's put together with ammonium sulfate. So our recommendation now is anytime you're spraying any dicamba product, even a little bit in the tank mix, you've got to avoid ammonium sulfate. So that's what you don't want in the tank mix with the new extend. There are new adjuvants being labeled and some of them are still going to get labeled before spring. So if you're going to be spraying dicamba in your Extend soybeans, if you're going to be spraying the new 2,4-D in Enlist soybeans, as those things get labeled, look for new surfactants that are coming on the market. Make sure you're working with your agronomist on that. Once again, I know it's tremendously confusing when you look at this whole thing with drift retardants, with spray adjuvants, we got new technologies out there. This agronomist recommends that, that agronomist recommends the other thing. I usually try to keep this thing pretty simple. We're not real big on drift retardants most of the time. I'd rather see you use the right spray nozzle. And then on the other side, I look at either non-ionic surfactant crop oil or methylated seed oil. And then I also may need a nitrogen source, but certainly like Darren said, for some of these really new technologies like Extender and List, there are special products for those, so make sure you talk to your agronomist about those. And if you have our Weed of the Week, you're going to need every option available because it's a tough one to control. We'll show you how to stop it coming up next. Mm -hmm.